This is gonna be a presentation on how to prevent generator failure with real-time ground fault monitoring, utilizing Acumetrics telemetry-based technology in support of uh, the power gen industry. So who is Acumetrics? Uh, we were founded in 1991. We're based in Latham, New York, uh, near Albany, the capital of New York State. The original founding member of the company used to work for GE for many years in Schenectady, kind of where it all got started. So that was our, our history was based in the, the power gen model from GE. Uh, we're a world leader in ground fault monitoring systems, primarily targeting um, brushless generators and motors. Uh, we utilize wireless digital telemetry systems to transmit sensor data from rotating shafts off to the stationary world. Just a little background on the modal shop. We are teamed up with the modal shop. They were founded in 1990. They're based out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Acumetrics falls underneath the modal shop uh, as part of a more systems-based company that's part of the PCB, larger PCB family. So the modal shop is a world leader in dynamic sensor calibration systems and services. They offer uh, many different features to support the entire power gen industry. They're a designer and manufacturer of the world's most portable vibration calibrator. Uh, that's the, that seems to be the main target and the, the interaction between Acumetrics and the mobile shop uh, moving forward. Acumetrics was purchased by PCB Piezotronics in 2013. Uh, PCB was founded in 1967. Their headquarters in Depew, New York, just outside of Buffalo, about four and a half hours from where Acumetrics is located. Uh, they're vertically integrated from machining to assembly. They have a 50,000 square foot machine center. It's very impressive. If, if no one has made it out there to visit that facility, I highly recommend you go out there and check it out. They're always welcoming uh, guests. Although now with the, the current global situation due to COVID-19, um, <laughs> please, Please uh, check ahead of time before trying to plan a trip to visit their facility. Uh, they're a world leader in sensors, industrial applications, power gen, aerospace and defense, automotive. Uh, they specialize in, in high temp um, for major turbine OEMs, uh, primarily the dynamic pressure sensors and accelerometers. So as you can see, um, based on Acumetrics, the modal shop and PCB, all part of the larger MTS system sensors family. Uh, we understand power generation. You know, we offer vibration monitoring systems, ground fault detection, um, proximity probe troubleshooting, combustion dynamics, industrial hygiene, slow speed vibration monitoring for hydropower. Uh, we kind of cover the whole, um, you know, the whole aspect of power generation from from start to finish. Somebody within our company will be able to support uh, pretty much any question you have on your censoring and monitoring and protection needs uh, throughout your facility. So a little bit about me. Um, I have a, a bachelor's of engineering technology. Um, I, after high school, joined the military, spent five years there and then utilized um, that through the GI Bill to kind of piecemeal my education together. Um, attended multiple universities uh, to finally get my bachelor's degree in engineering. Um, I've been with the company for over 12 years now. Uh, they've promoted me to the business development manager uh, within, with an area focused on the ground fault telemetry systems and going after the uh, end user market in North America primarily, uh, but eventually the world as well uh, for anything that's brushless exciter related. Uh, a little funny story about me. I was once in an ostrich relay race uh, when I was holding out for dear life. I just put that in because um, it was just a funny story I could think about myself. Uh, I was a teenager, was uh, in Africa uh, with my family and uh, ended up having to sit on the back of an ostrich with no saddle and just hold on underneath the feathers of the bird in this uh, like rodeo corral with a bunch of other people. And then they kind of released this gate and, and, and the ostriches took, you know, took off around this dirt track and uh, you ran into you ran a relay race with other members of your team. It was uh, quite an experience. So definitely a memorable um, story of myself. So some of the markets and industries that Acumetric serves, uh, you can see the list here: automotive, power gen, and ener energy, um, aerospace and defense, test and measurement. Uh, obviously, this presentation is going to be focusing mostly on the power gen and energy energy aspect of our business. But basically, anything that's rotating 
uh, and companies are looking to get sensor measurements off of a rotating shaft and transmit that wirelessly, that's what we specialize in. That's our bread and butter, um, specifically high speed applications, high temperature applications that other companies don't want to um, pursue. So we're very custom in nature, uh, a, a slightly different business model than what PCB has, uh, more in line with the modal shop in, in a systems based uh, approach to our business. Again, it's it's very custom. If it, nothing that we have is kind of off the shelf, so if a customer has a, a specific request, oftentimes our engineering team can meet the task to uh, come up with a system that can reliably and accurately measure that that data. So the agenda of this presentation is going to be just a kind of a quick background on generators. Um, what is a field ground fault, and how do we detect these faults? And then a little bit on the other motors and generators and um, solutions that we've come up with uh, to fit into different types of machines. So most gas and steam turbines use what's called a cylindrical rotor. You can see that here. And actually, I'm going to get my little uh, cursor available here. Um, so these consist uh, of this cylindrical style rotor. Uh, there's a bunch of forgings that are slotted to accommodate the turns of wire, which you can see um, in the copper conductors. They're about a three or four inch wide copper copper bus bar, copper conductor that run down into these dovetail forging grooves and form a giant turn of wire, just like a, a motor or generator. Uh, same concept. Uh, there's many thousands of these turns of wire. They're insulated from themselves with thin layers of insulation. And then they're also isolated from the metal of the rotor itself with fiberglass insulation pieces inside of these grooves. So the issue of a ground fault is you don't want there to be any current flow between the, you know, the high voltage, high amperage uh, flow of electricity in these bus bars and the metal of the machine itself, the forging of the rotor. Uh, if that happens, that can be very bad. Um, so these all these materials are exposed to centrifugal force, uh, thermal expansion and contraction. Uh, sometimes there's stress on the copper bus bars, there's stress on the rotor itself. There's you know dust gets in there. Somebody dropped a screw or a washer in there. There's lots of different things that may lead to a ground fault and can cause this to degrade over time. Uh, and if that happens again, if you have shorted turn to turns, or if you have shorts between the turns of the, the uh, field windings and the forging itself, um, then you're going to divert your current into that and you can cause significant damage. The worst being uh, it, with enough current flow, you can actually superheat this rotor to a point where it'll warp and bow, uh, causing, you know, as you would know, catastrophic uh, vibration issues and cavitation and severe damage um, and at that point would probably lead to replacing uh, the entire rotor. So here's an example of uh, a field ground fault. So basically uh, what I was talking about, it's the insulation degradation uh, can lead to that electrical connection be between the, uh, the windings themselves and the rotor forging. Uh, traditional Wisdom has always been, well, if you have one ground fault, it's not that bad because you're not diverting current through one connection. Uh, if you have a second ground fault, as the next bullet point says, two or more faults will then cause all of your current to divert directly into the rotor forging itself, causing this kind of damage you see over to the right where it's burned in um, and, and it has to then go out of service and be repaired. Um, it can lead to a lot of destruction and damage. Uh, it's not always true that two points of a ground fault are what uh, customers are most concerned with. You can have a single point failure. And in the next slide, that shows an example. This is the retaining ring that covers those field windings that they come out of each side of the rotor, where you saw them all stacked up in the previous slide. And this was from a single turn to turn short that developed in that and caused burning into the retaining ring that needed to be repaired. Uh, here's an example of what a generator stator may look like. Uh, again, we're not really focusing on this because this is all stationary side of things. So that cylindrical rotor will slide down into that stator 
where those lights, those work lights are um, causing, you know, to be able to create that electromagnetic field as the rotor spins around at 3,600 RPM. Um, so this is the brush rigging. There are two, basically two types of excitation systems for generators. You can think of the exciter as the power supply, essentially, for the generator. Um, so the two types are brushed and brushless. So in a brushed system, which is what this picture is, all of your brush rigging um, and your circuitry is out in the stationary world. They bring that across with this brush rigging assembly. They bring DC power source across to that, and they, they contact these slip rings that are uh, press fit onto the shaft itself. So that's how they're getting their DC power source out to the rotating shaft as the machine is uh, is spinning around. Um, in contrast to the brushed systems, they have what's called a brushless exciter. You can think of a brushless exciter basically as an inside out motor um, or an inside out generator, sorry. So they have the three phase AC windings Oh, sorry. And all of the uh, armature and uh, electronic circuitry and everything that is required to produce the DC field out on the rotor itself. So they have, uh, as, a result, as a result, you basically get AC currents on the rotor, three phase AC currents on the rotor. They have to be rectified um, using uh, silicone diode rectifiers to produce that DC current source that then powers the generator itself. So the challenge is how do we get access to um, to the rotating part of the, the circuitry on a brushless exciter? That's always been the challenge. So there are a few different ways that um, companies can do that. In the next few slides, we're gonna go over that in a little more detail. So this just shows you an example of what a brushless exciter may look like. And again, is going to be the focus of this presentation is primarily based on brushless exciters. So what are essential elements of a fuel ground detector on a brushless generator? It's a means of gaining access to the rotor. Like I mentioned before, you know, how, how do you get access uh, to something that's rotating and spinning at 3600 RPM, um, you know, on a giant piece of, of machinery the size of your house? Uh, it's a means of detecting a ground fault that may occur within those field windings out on uh, the generator itself. And then it's how you report that information or interface with the customer, with the operator. What type of, of data are they going to receive? So here's the kind of more traditional way uh, to get access to the rotor. It's a slip ring approach where they press fit these slip rings. I don't know if you can see to the right where my cursor is. So one of these slip rings is connected to uh, the, the steel of the machine itself or rotor ground, and the other one would be to the negative side of the field. Uh, when I talk about the negative and positive side of the field, all that basically means is, is one side of the field windings versus the other. So those, those copper bus bars go run out on the generator and form you know, many thousands of feet of, of windings and uh, one side would be referenced to negative and the other side would be to the positive side of the field. So most classical ground detectors are connected to the negative side of the field and rotor ground. Um, so they have these brushes that touch down, um, graphite brushes, I believe they are, that are powered by a solenoid. They touch down on the shaft as it's spinning, usually once per day. Uh, they inject a DC voltage that biases that negative side of the field slightly higher than rotor ground. And then it looks for current flow between the negative side of the field and rotor ground. If there is current flow, um, there is some circuitry that will detect if the um, resistance threshold is below a certain point, usually that's set at 10 K ohms. Anything below 10 K ohms will trigger an alarm and let the user know you've got a ground fault. Um, so there's no electronics out on the rotor. It's non-continuous. You obviously have the re reliability limits of a mechanical connection of those brushes touching on that slip ring. They need to be replaced um, at least once a year, a couple times a year. We run into a lot of customers where that solenoid doesn't work anymore. It's not making a good connection and there's no feedback to them to tell them there is or isn't a connection. Um, 
you can see the sort of the receiver part of the electronics is is very old. This system was probably designed and developed in the 50s or 60s. So it goes back uh, a very long time and there's almost no uh, serviceability of this. Customers can't find uh, support for this product. So the next style of ground fault detector is an optical transmission. Uh, this is just an optical IR module that mounts out on the rotating shaft. It gets its power source uh, from the excitation of the field voltage itself. Um, so it is continuous as long as the machine is online and running. It does have some reliability in it. Limits, of course, for an optical communication in a machine environment. If it's in a coal plant, a uh, dirty or dusty environment, those lenses can get uh, corroded or covered up and obviously stops working if that happens in the case. So the next style is, is ours, ground fault detection using radio frequency telemetry. So ours is induction, induction powered. Um, so what that means is we're bringing the necessary power across a wireless air gap out to the rotor mounted transmitter that powers our electronics out on the transmitter. And in turn, it sends a data signal across that air gap back to the stationary side um, to let us know what the field voltage is and the field resistance out on the generator. So it's the most reliable form of, of data communication. It's a digital data stream that gets sent across that air gap. So it's less susceptible to EMI or RFI noise. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it's viable and continuous at all times, even when the generator is off. So we'll go into a little more detail based on our technology. So here's just a, a basic diagram of what it works or how it works, sorry. So it's taking some type of uh, a sensor or rotor parameter, in this case, a field voltage and field resistance. It takes that information into our rotor mounted transmitter, which is an analog signal. We do some analog to digital conversion. We transmit that signal um, through a essentially a loop of wire. There are two loops of wire, one on the rotating world, one on the stationary world that forms that rotary transformer and creates that communication link between the rotating part and the stationary part. So data is flowing this way and power from induction power um, RF uh, radio frequency carrier is coming across that air gap this way. So once we digitize a signal on the rotor, we send a digital data stream across that air gap. It gets picked up in this loop of wire and then gets run to our stationary digital radio receiver, where we then do some digital to analog conversion and send the end users and power plants um, those signals. So they have some analog 4 to 20 current loop output signals that we provide and also some uh, Form C contact relays, uh, normally open, normally closed contact relays. And we'll go into that in uh, some more detail in the next few slides. So again, it's, it's, the, it's the link between the rotating world and the non-rotating world. Power this way, data coming back that way. So here's an example, um, basically modeling what a, a, a um, a field ground fault may look like. So first we have to kind of just define it as an analytical model for a ground fault. So um, it's it's defined as some value RL, some resistance um, and some location of that field windings on the rotor. Um, so what it is, is just basically looking for the potential difference of a fault like location relative to the negative side of the field windings and rotor ground itself. Um, so, uh, zero is at the negative side and one or hundred percent would be at the positive side uh, of the field windings. We provide what's called location factor K and we'll go into that in more detail as we cover, um, the process of how Acumetrics, um, measures for a ground fault. So the classical ground fault detection method, as I was talking about before, uh, it's a DC injection. Uh, voltage that they put out onto the, um, the, the the exciter shaft itself, and that biases that negative side of the field slightly higher than rotor ground. It looks for that current leakage to go from 
the field windings to rotor ground. And then there's some circuitry uh, of a threshold that's set out there to measure, um, you know, if you have current and you have voltage, you can calculate using ohm laws, the field resistance will be. And then the resistance, if it drops below a certain threshold, it'll trigger the alarm. In most cases, as I mentioned earlier, that's a single point threshold set at 10 K ohms. Uh, so a good field when it's rebuilt, rewound, uh, it first goes into service, maybe many tens of mega ohms. Um, uh, most utilities are only concerned with values below 500 K. It's very difficult to measure any accurate resistances over 500 K ohms. It just looks like a massive open wire at that point. Um, and as long as it's very high like that, utilities aren't concerned. They're concerned with low values of resistance. So then some of the some of the um, limitations of the classical method is the resistance threshold is dependent on the fault location. It's also dependent on the severity of the fault. So you would need a much more severe fault near the negative side of the field windings and a, a relatively minor fault near the positive side. Um, so that can potentially lead to possible false positive ground fault results. Uh, we've had customers air their frustration on that where they're, they thought their detector um, measured a low ground fault and they shut the machine down and did further testing, mega or hypot testing and, and discovered that that wasn't the case. Uh, it also only detects field resistance while the machine is running. Uh, and of course, in most cases, there are those mechanical and physical limitations from the either the optical sensor or the um, brush rigging uh, slip ring assembly. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, Ephraim system. So the Ephraim is our AT8000 series uh, piece of equipment. Uh, that is the um, Earth Fault Resistance Monitor is what Ephraim stands for. So that provides uh, continuous quantitative measurements of both the field insulation resistance and the excitation voltage. Uh, then, it, then what we offer is the location factor, which can help determine when a, or where on those field windings a ground fault has occurred. And I'll explain uh, how we do that in the next slide. Uh, we offer two ground fault alarm outputs, which are user adjustable. Uh, those come set from our facility at 100 K ohms and 2 K ohms. So we kind of view that as a warning alarm and then a ground fault alarm. So the, once the resistance drops below that threshold of 100 K, we will send an initial warning alarm to let the user know, you know, you don't, you don't have a ground fault yet. However, you are trending in that direction. Time to start paying a closer look at your machine and, and schedule an outage. So you can uh, investigate further and get that that damage repaired if needed. Um, we also offer a malfunction alarm. Again, the two ground fault alarm thresholds and the malfunction alarm others are those form C contact relays, normally open, normally closed. The malfunction alarm is a normally closed contact. The reason we do that is because if the Ephraim system loses power, um, it will open that alarm and, and let them know that there is a problem with the telemetry system. Uh, we also offer 4 to 20 milliamp uh, analog outputs, two channels. Channel one is for the field resistance that they can trend that historical information over time. And channel two is the field voltage. So many utilities use that feature. They interface that into their control room. And they're looking at that 4 to 20 current loop signal. Um, and once it falls below a certain threshold, you know, maybe 8 milliamps, 9 milliamps, something like that, they need to start paying closer attention uh, because they're, they're trending towards that ground fault. Um, we also offer uh, digital communication options. Uh, we, every system comes with its own PC software that allows you to have some historical archiving. Uh, you can trend the data through the software. Uh, it'll create a, um, a CSV drive in Excel format and will allow you to trend that data. So if you, for instance, receive that warning alarm, a lot of times we'll have the customers go down to the, to the receiver and plug right in with their laptop and start trending that information uh, over a whole day so that we can, we can take a look at that data and see, see it kind of moving in the right direction towards a ground fault or wrong direction if, if that's what, um, how they would see it. 
Uh, the Afro receiver also comes with optional ethernet output. Uh, we have yet to date had a utility opt to use that feature. Uh, it would involve um, them getting their IT infrastructure in place. They would need a network switch. And a lot of utilities are just uh, comfortable and used to using that, that current loop 4 to 20 signal. And that's what they continue to use. And we've had feedback from them that there's really no desire to move away from that uh, going into the future. And so that's, that's where we'll continue to, to offer. So a little bit of uh, history of uh, our global installations. Again, we offer a customized solution. So we are targeting more of a retrofit market where there, there are those existing ground detectors installed on these brushless exciters and the customers have those, those customer pains. They have those issues with them. Um, it's a newer technology. It's a much more precision measurement. Um, it allows the customer to know, have more confidence that their machine is being protected and being monitored. Um, we we use or we sell a lot of our systems OEMs. Uh, they are being built and shipped around the world on new machines. So many of the uh, the big suppliers will already have an Acumetrix ground detection system installed on them. So we have uh, some of that world class support is you know two hundred plus installations, uh, fifteen plus years experience of using the system, and again we are backed by that slogan of total customer satisfaction. You know if a customer's not happy, we can get you know parts to them, get stuff replaced, whatever we need to do to to keep that um, that TCS model moving forward. So here's a little bit of an example. What what's different from the Ephraim system versus the kind of classical method? Is instead of injecting just that set DC pulse voltage, we or sorry DC voltage, we inject a pulse uh, that's toggled from high to low. We also connect to the the positive side of the excitation field and the negative side. And as that pulse is toggled from high to low, we are doing high speed digital computate two simultaneous computations of the resistance value between the negative side of the field. And rotor ground and the positive side of the field and rotor ground and transmitting that off of the shaft simultaneously. So that way it does it eliminates that um, issue where the fault needs to be much more severe at the negative side versus the positive. Uh, it basically balances that out and makes it a much more accurate measurement uh, between those two points on the field windings itself. So the next uh, few slides are going to go over some of the examples of what our system looks like. Uh, the Ephraim system comes in two standard styles. One is called the end of shaft and the other one is the mid shaft. So this is an example of the end of shaft transmitter mounting system. Uh, this typically goes on smaller air cooled units. Uh, you can see the gray transmitter is this piece uh, that's mounted on the end of the rotor. Uh, there's a rotor end cap which is underneath this is all standard stuff that would already be on any smaller air cooled unit and we can easily adapt our transmitter right in the center line so that eliminates any balance issues um, you know any concerns with uh, high speed vibration and things like that uh, we mount it right to the end of the shaft and then we uh, we install the stationary pickup antenna which is this white ring antenna so there are turns of wire on the id of this white pickup antenna and then on the OD of this gray transmitter snout. And that is what makes a connection to form the rotary transformer uh, between the rotating world and the stationary world. And we transmit that across approximately a three eighths to half inch air gap. And then we're bringing power back the other way to power all of our electronics out on the motor. So you don't need any battery or power source um, out on the rotor itself, everything comes from the stationary side and that digital data comes back and runs off to our receiver. Uh, to the right, you can see this is an example of a customer mounting our receiver on some Unistrut um, that, you know, that's usually we would recommend that they do that. That would be something that the end user would be responsible for. Uh, they would take care of the installation of our equipment. Uh, we would send this out ahead of time before their scheduled outage and a lot of this stuff can get done and mounted before we show up to do the installation and commissioning of the rotor mounted components. Um, there's only one link that needs to go between our receiver 
and the pickup antenna, and it's just this coaxial cable. So again, that's a fairly simple installation from their end. And then the end user would be responsible for any of the outputs that have to run off to their control room to interface uh, the FM system to their um, operators. So here's just some more examples of our FM receiver. We offered a cooled option. Uh, this is used in many areas uh, such as the Middle East or um, the Southwest or the Southeast of the United States where uh, the environment is very hot. Ambient temperatures can easily exceed you know, 100 or 120 degrees F. Our FM receiver electronics are rated at 50 degrees C, so that's approximately uh, 122 F. So with the addition of the cooler, they're allowed to operate, I believe it's another 20 degrees F above that um, and gives them that assurance that the, the sensitive electronics are gonna be protected uh, over time. Uh, to the right, just another example of a non-cooled version and what it may look like installed at a utility. This, this customer chose to mount this just directly to the concrete bulkhead right below uh, the exciter doghouse. And then they they supplied the conduit that ran our coaxial cable up up um, about 80 feet above to the exciter doghouse, and then all the outputs from our system run into it, run in the other conduits off to the control room. So pretty standard stuff on how we would see uh, our system installed at a power facility. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> So here's a kind of more of a close up of the receiver, uh, the digital computer interfaces that we offer, as well as the um, the relay contacts and the analog outputs. So in order to set up the Ephraim system on site during the install and commissioning, you would have to connect a USB to serial port cable to the RS-232 connection. Uh, that connects right to a laptop easily where you've installed the Ephraim View software and that allows the user to adjust those um, field resistance thresholds of the warning and ground fault alarm, um, as well as change the, the um, speed at which that data transmission happens between transmitter and pickup. You can adjust that. Um, we usually recommend that customers leave that transmission data rate at about 10 seconds or more, just to um, eliminate any kind of like false positive readings, uh, there's really no need that you need a faster measurement than than about 10 seconds because, um, you know, this is not going to, this is not going to be something quick. This will be, this is a long term monitoring feature that uh, they're looking at that field resistance for a year or 2 years at a time. Um, up in the top right is the AC or DC power input um, into our electronics. As long as that power is brought into our receiver. The telemetry system is going to be functioning um, and that is is why and these orange blocks here are the uh, form c contact relays and that's why that first one the malfunction alarm is that normally closed contact so that if there is a loss of power or any interruption in that it'll trip that con you know it'll open that normally closed contact allowing the user that or allowing the user to know there's an issue with the telemetry system uh, the next two orange blocks are alarm two and alarm one, the warning and ground fault alarm. Uh, and then there's just some other terminal block interfaces for the analog uh, four to 20 current loop outputs. And then over at the bottom left corner, this is the um, a rabbit microcontroller board that houses the software, Ephraim View software, and also offers that ethernet connection uh, via RJ45. Um, but again, we haven't had any utilities opt to use that feature um, since since I've been with the company. So here's a, an example of what the Ephraim View software would look like. Um, it offers them a graph of what the resistance trend plot will look like over time. It's going to appear as sort of this scatter because again, um, it's not able to measure accurately any resistance values over that 500 K ohm. It's just going to look like a massive open circuit. So it's kind of toggling between, in this case, it looks about 10 meg ohm and 100 meg ohm. Uh, what, when this resistance starts to drop down and gets below that 500 K value range, it'll become a, a, um, 
a much more linear plot that you'll see that graphic interface really start to show uh, the resistance more accurately. Uh, so again, the, the customer should not have any concerns. This, this would be a healthy rotor. This is what we would normally expect to see um, that scatter pattern up above, um, you know, at least one meg ohm. Um, usually, like I said, on a good rotor, it's, it's that 10 to 80 meg ohm range. So the user can then adjust some of the thresholds down the bottom right corner. There's an access code, and this is um, detailed in the manual that every system would get. Uh, the, the access code is the same for every FM system. It's Tesla exclamation point, and then that'll allow you to go into the setup and change those uh, field resistance threshold values. Uh, some users like to, to keep that a little closer together. So instead of 100K and 2K, they may opt for something like, um, you know, 60K and 20K. Uh, again, that's that's totally um, customizable to each plant and how they choose to interface to that um, that output. Uh, then we have the on the right hand side, you can see the disk archiving setup that allows um, the user to start archiving the data and it will export that to um, Microsoft Excel uh, CSV drive. And they can they can look at that data um, over a much longer period of time. Again, we would probably suggest they do that once that initial ground fault alarm, that warning alarm comes in. Uh, they don't need to do that all the time. They, that's what they're utilizing that 4 to 20 uh, current loop output. That's the trending feature that they're most concerned with monitoring. So why would you utilities consider upgrading to the AFM system? Uh, you know, we've harped on this quite a bit, but it's really just the poor reliability. Uh, it's very hard to get serviceable items from these old uh, ground detection systems. They've been in service for 60 or 70 years. Um, they have a very high impact failure, and you know that doesn't give them that uh, confidence that their machine's being monitored properly. So what a lot of utilities will do in that case is they'll schedule sort of unnecessary outages just to check and make sure they don't have a ground fault and turn the unit off. And when you're, when you're off, not creating energy, you're losing money. Um, and that's something that they don't like. So uh, our trending information and our ability to more accurately measure the field resistance uh, gives them that peace of mind that they're gonna be monitored much more accurately than the traditional systems um, that are out there. Uh, so here's an example we covered uh, the first part was the end of shaft Ephraim system. Uh, this is a example of what an exciter may look like on a much larger, um, typically hydrogen cooled machine. Uh, to the right where this wood uh, covering is, is the PMG or permanent magnet generator uh, for the exciter. There's some cooling fans. Uh, there's a, 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 an exciter bearing. And then in here is all the uh, armature and circuitry for the precious exciter. Then there's the uh, diode rectification wheels, of one for the negative side and one for the positive side of the field. And then it goes down um, more of the exciter shaft to this coupling flange all the way over to the left-hand side. And this is where the exciter will then couple to the generator itself. So this is typically where we would plan on mounting our next style of Ephraim system, which is that mid shaft style. And we'll go into more detail in the next few slides. So here's an example of the mid shaft Ephraim transmitter. It's a two piece split collar design that has an electronic module on one half and then a, a, a weighted dummy module in the other half that weighs the exact same as the electronic module. Um, it's connected across this half joint here with uh, high, high, uh, strength unbreako bolts is how we make that contact uh, and it's torqued down to each shaft dependent uh, there's a specific torque rating that will be in every manual dependent on the size of the shaft as well as the speed of the machine itself uh, as i mentioned earlier in north america most power generation machines rotate at 3600 rpm some of the larger machines are 1800 rpm so again speed and diameter are those two critical components that we're going to need uh, in order to accurately design this mid shaft solution to their uh, specific to their exciter. Here's a close up of how we make that um, half joint of the collar. Again, it's uh, uh, high, 
high uh, strength bolt that goes through and uh, gets bolted down across that half joint. And then we also provide a locking set screw uh, as another mechanical feature just to give you um, or the end user that extra peace of mind that that bolt could never come loose or, or work its way out. Uh, this is the electronic module that's embedded in the steel collar itself. We have to make connection to rotor ground. So as I was explaining before, uh, the process to uh, accurately measure for the field uh, resistance and field voltage, we have to make contact to the negative side and the positive side of the field, as well as rotor ground. So we use the steel collar itself to get that rotor ground connection. So that has to get mounted directly to the shaft a very tight um, fitting um, application so that that's a, a reliable electronic uh, ground connection. And then the, on the other side is where the positive and negative leads run off onto the board itself and make that contact. And we'll go into a little more detail on that. So here's a typical mid shaft installation, what it may look like. So again, this is the coupling flange uh, that is gonna mate up to the generator, which would be off to the left which would have an identical coupling flange that they, they then get all bolted together. Um, so you have to be able to get the uh, electronic bus connection, the negative and positive side of the field from the exciter over to the generator. And this is how they decouple it from that. And I'll show you in the next few slides how they get that uh, electrical connection. Um, so this is uh, the end view of what, of what the um, rotor has. And the exciter will have the exact same coupling just like this. So those those field voltage connections on the plus and minus are run through the bore of the rotor itself and the exciter rotor as well. And they're broken out into what's called this butterfly leaf assembly. Where So one of these um, copper bus bars will be the negative side and one will be the positive side. They're isolated from the rotor by um, typically it's G10 or G11 uh, fiberglass material and that as well from, from themselves or from each other with another piece of, uh, of insulation material. So this one on the right is a cross-sectional view of how we make that connection. So inside that coupling flange bore uh, is how they bolt together the two butterfly leaves that match up. And we just drill and tap a quarter 20 stainless steel threaded rod right into one of those um, large hex head bolts and we run our threaded rod right through that coupling flange bore directly into our rotor mounted transmitter. So that would be your plus and your minus uh, field voltage connection. It's a very reliable way of getting access to that um, electrical connection and is as least invasive as possible for the for the end users. Um, they really don't have to modify any part of their machine uh, except for that drilling and tapping of the, the two bolts where that contact is made. So that's an example of the uh, butterfly leaf uh, field voltage contact. We then um, will cover our, our stainless steel threaded rod in this fiberglass material to prevent um, any risk of voltage breakover to the coupling flange bore itself, which would obviously be, uh, you know, field, field ground or, you know, metal steel of the machine. So these pieces will offer strength and will be a tight fit inside that bore to prevent any bending or warping of our um, threaded rod, and then this, this, the uh, more narrow pieces are just covering it and to prevent the uh, isolation from uh, voltage break. And then it just gets threaded in with this this um, pipe thread piece on the end, and that shows an example of how we install that uh, into the coupling flange on the larger. Again, this is for the larger, typically hydrogen cooled um, Westinghouse machines is how we do the connection for the negative and positive side of the field. Uh, we then will coat the threads with a special, um, I mean, this looks like Teflon tape. We've, we've since gone to a special uh, epoxy that has PTFE uh, material embedded in it that we will coat those threads. And then we provide a seal washer on the end of the um, of this uh, pipe thread piece to protect against any risk of a uh, hydrogen leak that comes out of that bore. Uh, we were approached by one of our OEMs many years ago that there was a very, very small uh, chance that hydrogen could leak out 
Uh, so we've gone the extra steps to prevent any of that. And we've actually had this whole assembly tested uh, by a company and it's able to withstand um, up to 20 PSI of, of gas leak pressure. And the spec was only to prevent uh, 10 PSI. So it's more than capable of, of preventing any, any risk of leak of hydrogen into the exciter. Uh, this shows the collar mounted to the steel of the rotor itself. Again, we need the utilities to have this uh, a good clean surface for us to mount because this is how we're picking up that electrical ground connection. So this this is they've done a very good job here. Um, they probably removed a little more paint than than what would probably be necessary. Uh, we usually just need it right underneath where our steel uh, has to bolt to the shaft itself. Uh, but this was a, a customer that did a very nice job for us. So that is the that was an example of the larger hydrogen cooled machines. Here's an example of what the exciter may look like again for that end of shaft system on the smaller air cooled units. Uh, this is the, the other retrofit option that we have that's that's a little more detailed than the first pictures I showed. Um, so these are the diode rectifier wheels. You can kind of see in here where these heat sinks are underneath, there are uh, two parallel diodes uh, that do parallel for redundancy. If one dies, the other one can still um, do that rectification. There's gonna be a positive wheel and a negative wheel uh, behind it. Then this red piece is what's called the rotor end cap. So this is all what would normally be on a smaller air cooled unit. This is, this is very typical to what we would see. So we came up with the concept of why can't we just mount our transmitter right to the end of the shaft um, and just have them modify this rotor end cap by putting a small hole in the center of the end cap? And so that's the style that we do uh, for many of our, our uh, end of shaft systems. So here's an example of the rotor end cap that's been um, machined and modified with a hole in the center. Uh, we then can um, run uh, wires down to the bus bars, which are underneath this. So one side would be positive and the other side is the negative side of the field. Uh, then we provide an aluminum adapter plate that picks up the existing holes that are already in the rotor end cap. So again, the customer doesn't need to machine or drill and tap any holes for that. We're, we try to design everything so that it can pick up what's already there uh, and make it as easy as possible for them to retrofit this equipment into their generator. And then once that aluminum adapter plate is installed, we can mount our rotor mounted transmitter, which is this gray piece, uh, picks up this four volt pattern right to the adapter plate. Uh, once the transmitter is successfully mounted and we connect the, the negative and positive side of the field and rotor ground, we then can install the stationary components, which are this um, G10 fiberglass tube piece, which we call the top hat assembly. Over to the right, you can probably see why we call it that. Um, that has some T80 material that we allow um, the pickup, the stationary pickup to be adjustable axially. So we can we can slide this pickup in and out um, and align it to where we see uh, fit. The idea is uh, you want to align it slightly uh, actually towards us in this picture. So that way you allow for the rotor growth uh, when the machine is running for a day or two, it'll reach uh, thermal equilibrium and will actually grow and push that rotor mount transmitter towards us. So having this setup allows us to adjust that um, to a range that's going to be the most optimal. Our equipment will operate at a, a fairly good range. It's, it's typically plus or minus an inch. So even if this stationary component is misaligned up to one inch, um, you know, towards us or, or further in, in the uh, Z direction, if you will, that'll still operate. Uh, but we, you know, we obviously want to install this equipment and commission it to the most ideal uh, setting possible. And then once that's all done, we put a, a plate cover piece over that, and then that just gets connected to a flexible conduit uh, where we have that BNC uh, cable run off to our stationary receiver. So again, why switch to ground fault Ephraim system? Um, customizable, that's really the biggest thing. You know, that's the, the thing we're trying to push most uh, in this presentation is that we offer that ability to retrofit um, existing many different types of generators and exciters that are out there that may or may not have a ground detection system on them. 
Uh, so that's really the market that we go after is, is competing with other companies that already have a system and we're replacing it with uh, something much better and much more accurate. It gives you that continuous monitoring um, at all times of the generator. Some of the advantages are, are that ability to trend that data over time so they can monitor for that breakdown. On their traditional systems, it's it's literally just a go, no go. You know, that that old brush actuator style, they may contact and take a measurement one day and it's fine. The next day you come in, you've got a ground fault. You have no sense of predictability of knowing when that may occur. Do you know if you're at 15K ohms one morning and you're very close to that 10K threshold and you come in the next day and all of a sudden you've got a ground fault and everybody starts panicking, shut the unit down and um, you know get get some repair done. So that's that's the biggest advantage is just that ability to monitor it over time. Reliable, long-term, healthier machine. Um, cost savings, I, I really can't stress that enough. You know, avoiding those unplanned outages can cost utilities, uh, you know, many millions of dollars um, if they have a forced outage and they're not planning for it. And if they're one of these smaller plants, um, a lot of times, not only are they down and not producing energy, but they have to buy energy from a competitor um, to support their portion of the grid. Uh, and as you can imagine, a competitor is not is not going to be selling you power uh, at a at a very cheap rate. Um, so I just wanted to kind of summarize this with some of our future webinars that we're going to be having uh, in our 2020 series. Um, up next, it's going to be on December 10th, the human human vibration measurements, uh, risk limits, and mitigation. And then on December 17th. It's uh, why calibrate the importance of accelerometer and pressure sensor calibration. So thank you again for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you.